case you don't know me, I'm Robin Campbell, and I am going to be talking about using game theory in the high school mathematics classroom. Um, I could give you the formal definition of game theory, but I thought that it would be more fun to show you. So, okay. First game. So I'm going to hand out ten pieces of paper. Do you people have writing, writing instruments? Uh, no. I do. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to give... One, two, three. Actually, I'm going to give this job away. Cheyenne? Oh. <laughs> I, I did pretty well. I've uh, given three, four. You can want the other person? No, just ten. Mm -hmm. So I've given one, two, three, is that it so far? Can you give out seven more? Just okay. anyone. So some people don't get it. Some people might not. No. That's okay. Keep this contained. So if you don't have a writing utensil, maybe can you throw one down? One last one. On the end there. All right, so the name of the game is that you're going to pick a number in between 1 and 100. Integer values only, please. Don't be like my students and choose like pi. It's annoying. I want you to choose the number. So, okay, what's going to happen? Everybody will submit their number. And then I am going to calculate the average. And the person whose number is closest to half of that average will win. Okay? Understand? So, number between 1 and 100. You want to be half the average. Oh, this is just like the one forever. I'm giving you 30 seconds. Does our number have to be an integer as well? Wait. What? Yes, Wait. every number has to be an integer. It, give me an integer. So Make we have to two easy. numbers. No, a whole number. Oh my gosh. One whole number. One whole number. This is not complicated. Between one and one. Make it easy. Oh, oh I you get it. You put 100, you're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, but no, I remember it's like. Lisa, I'm glad I'm not playing this game. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the chair. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, so I have ten, ten people, ten numbers? Yeah. Okay. Again, this room's a little awkward. So everybody has their number. I'm going to trust you. Or go around, read out your number. I'm going to enter them. Just, you know, look at everybody else's number and make sure they're being honest and not changing it. Okay? Oh, who's first? Derek? Eighteen. Eighteen. Okay. Oh, I was to go to 37. But half the, half the average. 10. 20. 20? 37. 34. 34. Mm. 34. 34. 34. Mm. 34. 34. 34. 34. Okay. <laughs> so, I'm going to say that 12 wins. Every time. <laughs> nice job. All right. So, Tom, tell us about your strategy. How did you choose 12? Because um, what I thought everyone else was going to do mm -hmm. is be like, well, the average between 1 and 100 is yeah. 50. Okay. So, they aim for half of 50. Okay. So, then I was like, I'll aim for half of what they're aiming for. 12. Very cool. cool. Anybody else want to share how they got their number? I did the same thing. Like he just told us, but not the smart way. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, fifty. Sure enough. We're around there. Okay. So that's game one. This is very slow. Okay. Game two. I have some cards. What is written on the cards is not important. It is actually for a completely different activity. What is important is that there are 21 of them. Okay? So I'm going to distribute these. Um, maybe, or actually, I, mean, I, I think I only have six, so every couple people. What do you want us to do? Cards or pencils? Here's another one. You want us to give one to each? Uh, no, no. Um, no, not one card to each. One, one package, right? Yes? For two people. Yeah, per two people-ish. You'll play with two people. If you don't have 
um, a card or a partner, just watch somebody else. I have one more set if anybody wants to play. Okay. All right, so in this game, you have 21 cards. Um, each card should have a front and a back, just my glue is really bad, so they're separating. There should be 21 of them in total, okay? Um, you and your partner, so first of all, you do rock, paper, scissors um, to see who goes first. Then you and your partner will take turns. You will take either one, two, or three cards. The name of the game, you want to be left with the last card. You want to, you know, you want to get down to three cards so that you can take all of them, two cards so they can take two, one card so you can take one. You want to be the last, the last man standing. Understand? Okay. So try it out. Take a minute. Shoot, rock, paper, Shoot. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. So you go first. You pick one card. You pick one, two, or three cards. Oh. Okay, so you can take one, two, or three. It's one and the last person to get a card. No, yeah. the one who has the last one. Did you take one? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if you win, you take two. And if you lose, you take one. You take two. 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 Wait, so she has to copy them. No, no, no. You take one, two, or three, and then she takes one, two, or three. There it is. One, two, three. I wasn't going to count. Five, six, seven, eight. And that was the big one. Yeah, but you just tried to count. Please, sir. No, but it's not. Right, so you have three left. If you have time, play another game. See if anything changes. Okay, I think because we don't have 21, so we're going to have to track them. It's probably because they chipped. Yeah, they're unfortunate. Yeah. I don't know how many cards are there. You're right. Why do you want to put them out of the table? It's actually immortal. Four left? Yeah. You know, that's who won. That's the last one. That's the last one. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, can the last person take three, or does it have to be yeah. one at the end? Yep, the last person has to take three. Oh, I didn't know that. So nice. I no, I didn't know that. You, I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> didn't know that. <laughs> he tried to trick me. No, I didn't know. Wait, there's more than 21 uh, cards, though. Scissors in. Scissors in. There was more than 21 uh, cards, because they got separated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, okay, done. I'm trimming it. Good. I'm not trimming it. Two. 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 Okay, ready? Go. All right, I'm giving you one more minute. Finish whatever game you're on. This one's done. Yeah, a four of six, and there's 50 left. Yeah. Four, 50 left. All right, it looks like we're all almost out there. Seven? No. Okay, so the question I will ask you, what was your strategy? Did you have one? Counting. Counting. Pray that I get the last one. Prayer. <laughs> Prayer's a great strategy. Yeah. Any other strategies? Six, seven, I lost six. the first 10 games, so my strategy was to win near the end. You played 10 times? Believe. Wow. Okay. <laughs> we think too much. Okay, right? so what if I told you that there's a... I'll give you one. There's lots of strategies for this game. I'll give you one that if you win the luck of the draw, it's a show in. Okay? Um, so you do rock, paper, scissors. Okay, so, so the scenario, let's say, you know you're golden if you're left with four cards and it's their turn, right? Because they will either take one, you can take three, they can take two and you can take two, or they'll take three and you'll take one, okay? So you've won if there's four left. You can technically set that up for multiples of four, right? So if they had eight, they take one, you can take three, and you're left with four. So what you want to do, and I mean you can do this even if, 
um, if you don't go first, um, if you know the strategy and they don't. But on your first turn, take one card. If you if you win rock, rock paper scissors, okay, then you're left with a multiple of four, and you can play the the sum of fours game. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So that was my introduction to game theory for you all. Um, I do actually want to give you a little bit more of a formal definition. Uh, so game theory, it's more than just just games, right? We play a lot of games in school. We play a lot of games growing up. Game theory is actually a branch of mathematics. So a game is defined very specifically. I lost that. Okay. So for a game, you must have players playing by some rules. So there's more than one player involved. They are operating under a set of rules. Um, there has to be some sort of stakes. So they have to either gain something or lose something or have the potential to do so. Um, the outcomes of this game is going to depend on the choices that have been made. Okay, um, so <coughs> additionally, last thing, is that the decisions that you make will be influenced by what you think the decisions that the other players are going to make are. Okay, so there might be some element of probability in your game, but there's also the kind of the human element, the human um, the, the strategy, the, the making that choice, okay? So in my capstone, I wanted to say, hey, why don't we do this in high school? This sounds like fun. Um, to back this up, I did a literature review, I did a curriculum analysis looking at the QEP, and I did a self-study looking at my, my own classrooms and implementing such activities. So the first thing I did was a literature review, so just taking a look, um, see if anybody else does game theory in high school. And the answer to that is not, not a lot of people do game theory in high school. Um, it's, I found a few studies about people who have tried it for various reasons, um, but most of what I found was really on, either on the secondary level or it was not to do with mathematics. Okay. Um, I did find some stuff, so, so I grouped it into three different benefits that I thought that it could um, bring to the, uh, to the Quebec math curriculum in three main areas where I think it, it has a bit of a deficiency. Um, those were a lack of authentic problem solving, um, this focus on the ministry exams, and also issues with interdisciplinar interdisciplinarity. Right? We talk about it a lot, we don't see it a lot in schools. So what did I find from my small pickings in the literature? Um, it, there has been evidence that it showed that game theory does promote active learning in high school students. Um, mostly, it's, it's very engaging because it's all often introduced using games, which high school students don't tend to like. Um, it's also very easy to do an, kind of an inquiry-based activity with them where they kind of um, run the show and come up with answer, or questions and, and answer them. Um, one study showed that it helped students reject sort of a, a formalistic view of mathematics, so the idea that uh, math is just equations and um, purely man-created and not really connected to the real world, a very abstract, abstract view of mathematics. Um, they, were, they were more likely to reject that. At the same time, they did a little bit better on their standardized tests than their, their peers. Interesting. Just a couple of studies. Um, I also found that it lends itself very well, since most of what I did find was in different subject areas. I did find that it lends itself very well to uh, cross-curricular, um, interdisciplinary units and activities. Lots of people have done it, maybe not even between math and another subject, but between, say, um, English and, what was that example? I guess, social science. So there's definitely examples of people trying this, but, but not a ton that are connected with high school math. So then I thought, well, how could I connect it with high school math? Um, so I looked at the QEP, our best friend. I looked at two things. I looked at the math, the specific math competencies, and I also looked at the math outcomes for learning from the progression of learning document. So I was able, so the three math competencies um, have to do with um, situational problem, um, using I'm 
you, Lisa. <laughs> um, using mathematical reasoning, um, and finally using mathematical language, which is not tested, but I think is very important. Okay, so I found that you could argue game theory based on um, based on the literature, also based on the definition of game theory. Um, you could argue that it does satisfy all three of these math competencies. It can be used to develop them. Um, I also uh, found seven places in the math QEP where you could maybe teach game theory, okay? And most of them had to do with probability uh, and statistics. So that's kind of, because game theory is often a mixture of probability and also that kind of human element. Okay. So that was my curriculum analysis. Last part was my self-study. So I actually did um, activity, an activity about game theory with my students. So I did this with two sections of enriched SEC 4, which means that there were SEC 3 doing SEC 4. Um, one SEC 4 and, oh, Siri decided that he's going to record me saying that. Excellent. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, what was I saying? Oh, and one and one section of secondary five. Um, so the activity that I did was the the prisoner's dilemma. So in a nutshell, the prisoner's dilemma: the situation is that you have two prisoners, A and B. They are convicted for some crime, and they get um, brought into the station by the police. Okay. Um, when they're brought in, they're separated, so they have no way to talk to each other. And the police, well, they have enough evidence to convict the prisoners on a lesser crime. Um, but they really want to get them for, for the big crime, like they've been chasing them for ages, okay? So they offer each prisoner a deal, okay? And the deal is, okay, if you both stay silent, you know, you, you, don't, you don't talk, you'll both get a year for those minor, minor charges, okay? If you confess or testify against your, your co, your colleague in crime, <laughs> um, you and the, your uh, prisoner B stay silent, then you get to go free, and prisoner B gets five years. Okay? The opposite is true. So if you stay silent, and the other guy decides to tell on you, then you get five years, and they get to go free. The final scenario is if you both tell on each other, then you both get three years. Okay? So I ran this like a bit of a simulation. I did it like rock, paper, scissors. So they go around, um, except that there's only two options. So we just did rock, which is stay silent, and paper, which is confess. So they had a table. They wrote down all the results from interactions, the same rock, paper, um, with every other student in the class. I got them to tally up their results. And the person with the lowest amount of years in jail at the end won a prize. It was Skittles. It was all Skittles. <laughs> so, how did that go? Um, I, um, to complement the literature, I found a very, very high level of, of engagement with my, with my students doing this. But not only for the game part, because we know that students like to play games, right? It's fun, it's enrichment, um, it's Friday afternoon, right? Um, but they were also really in, invested and engaged with the discussion part and asked some really good, like deep, questions that show that they were they were really thinking about this critically and really trying to untangle the, the strategy behind the different um, your different options. Um, I asked them about their strategies and they gave me a very wide range um, which is really cool. Um, some of them were no strategy. Um, some of them decided that they would always confess or that they'd always stay silent. Um, and they all had very interesting reasons. They brought in the human element a lot. They brought in probability and chance a lot. Um, the actual solution to this, um, and this is called the Nash equilibrium for the game theorists out there, um, is that's a situation where everybody's playing their best strategy. So the solution to this is to actually always confess. Because if you think about uh, if you think about the scenario in terms of what the other person is going to do. Think about what's best for you. So if they stay silent, the best thing for you to do would be to confess, right? Because that means you get to go free. If they do confess or testify, then the best thing for you to do would be to also testify, right? Um, because otherwise, you're going to get in there for five years and they're going to get to go free, 
okay? So there is a solution, but notice that if everybody always plays a solution, you're actually worse off than if you decided to cooperate, right? If you were to cooperate, you'd only get one year each, and, you, and your total time would be two years rather than six years, right? So, um, so that's kind of where the dilemma part comes into it, and that's kind of where the human element comes in. So I thought that's very interesting. Um, one thing I wanted to uh, <laughs> warn you against is that by its nature, I believe that game theory is, I mean, it's a, a mathematics of application. <coughs> so inevitably, you're going to get questions in a math classroom that are completely outside of your field. So I had some students asking me about kind of the ethics of this. They're like, Miss, are you trying to teach us to be dishonest? <laughs> and I was like, well, no. And we had, we had a conversation about like um, the power of knowledge and <laughs> deciding, you know, um, you know, you can do good with it, you can do evil with it, what are you going to choose? That sort of thing. Um, so you're probably going to have to deal with things, and especially you, you're, you're going to have to prepare yourself for that type of question. Um, unless you're, you know, you're able to, to do this in a cross-curricular way uh, where someone else can feel those questions for you. <laughs> okay, so finally, talk about my conclusion and honestly my conclusions for this was mostly just questions. I basically came up with more questions than I had at the beginning and really didn't go through much of anything, I'm just being honest. <laughs> um, I think it's important to note that engagement does not equal learning. So I think it's very important to see whether or not um, using game theory can be used to teach content because I surely used it as an enrichment activity, right? So enrichment. So I can, I can attest that it's very successful as an enrichment activity, um, especially I found that um, it worked I know I, I feel like it works very well with, with older students because they're able to have that, that sort of rich discussion about it. Um, but I, I need to figure out if it can actually be used to, to, teach, to teach content. Um, the connections that I did make in the Q, QEP were a little bit of a stretch and it's definitely not, say, the easiest way to teach probability, for example, right? Um, so more work needs to be done there. Um, also in terms, you know, of setting out to um, remedy the, the gaps in the QEP, like does it actually provide authentic learning? Learning Is that little introduction enough? Or um, do you actually need a whole unit on game theory to actually do it justice? I'm not sure. Um, I think I've shown or discovered that this would definitely work very well across disciplines. So if, I, if there's any social scientists out there, who would like to collaborate with me on this, I'd, <laughs> I'd, I'd be happy to buy your copy and talk about it. Um, and yeah, and I would definitely like to expand the, the scope of this project in terms of looking at activities, um, units, maybe, you know, kind of a, a more longitudinal enrichment scenario. That's actually it. At this time, Robin has seven minutes within the 30 minutes, but in actuality, we have about 23 minutes for this block of time. So if you have any questions, don't worry, Robin. <laughs> so if you have any questions <laughs> for seven minutes, you can ask her any questions. Uh, and then the other minutes, you can float around the room and stretch until the next block. I would advise you not to go into the other presentations because some of them are 45 minutes and they won't be done until 7.35, okay? So at this time, if you have any questions for Robin, this would be the time. I have a question. So if you play a game, is it automatically game, in gamification? Like, um, do you get what I'm saying? So this has nothing with, really to do with game. Well, let's say, okay, sorry, let's say, for example, you play like Jeopardy. Is that automatically like adding something to the learning, do you think? Or are they not inherent? Um, so just like using the game yeah, very directly to use, yeah. So, I mean, I think that it speaks to, like in this project I found games really engage kids. Um, this engagement equal learning all the time, always. I, I don't think so. I think kids can be very engaged in 
scenarios where they're they're not learning, or sometimes they even get swept up in the excitement of the game and kind of um, lose track of the content and, and the, the aims. So I think often when it like when it's done right, it can be really effective, but it also can be effective. Yeah, because last time I played a game, like mm -hmm. I played with two different groups the same game for a test review, and one group got very competitive with each other, and they. It's like almost like they thought we were playing the game for game's sake and not for learning's sake. Mm -hmm. So how would you set up a game to make it seem serious and not like a... I mean, it, it depends what your what your aims are. Um, when, I'm, when I'm trying to teach game theory, I really like the idea of them getting super competitive. Because I saw a lot of that in, in the activity that I did, that, that students were getting really worked up about it, getting really yeah, competitive and and sharing, you know, their, their results. Well, she's only got 20 years so far. She's got like 90 years. It's crazy. Um, so, if the co competitive element, and I think in most scenarios, the competitive element, I mean, it's it's again helpful in engagement, but not necessarily helpful um, in you know content retaining content. But I mean, there's something to be said to for being competitive, like I think um, a girl in my class in grade seven memorized like something like 60 digits of pi to win a contest. So like sometimes you do, you, you can, you know, use comp competition to aid in learning. So I, yeah, it, it, in terms of how to set that up per se, I'm, I'm still kind of playing with that, so. Thank you. Um, so we talked a lot in our methods class this semester about um, like playing games in math class. Yeah. Not necessarily to get content, but just like get people in the classroom. Yeah. So did you find that like after this activity, people were more excited to come to your class, or was it like as soon as they realized they were back on the same old stuff that their enthusiasm just like died immediately? No, I think I I like to incorporate a lot of little things like with my students, a lot of um, kind of changes of of pace to kind of keep things interesting. I think that. Um, that was kind of my first big, with all, I think all of these students, it was my big kind of enrichment class that was just like purely fun. And I think that actually did help, it helped get students in, engaged and they were talking about it like, you know, the whole next week, they were like, Miss, can we do that again? Can we do something like that again? Like we were like, game three, we want to help you, they're, you know, they're manipulating you, they're like, we want to help you do well on your project, like all that stuff. Um, so. I, I think that incorporating these activities definitely helped me kind of build that positive rapport with my students and just kind of show them that math can be fun. Like, oh, math is fun in that area. Maybe I should try to look for the fun in math in this area and then me trying to facilitate that by still including activities and games and that sort of thing. Are there any other questions for Robin? Well, thank you very much, Robin. Thank you. Uh,